So have you ever heard the story about the Swiss watch knobs? They had this contest that they would pat each other on the back. It was a good old boys network. And for a hundred years, things were fine till an upstart from Asia showed up and kicked all their asses and getting their butts kicked. That wasn't even the most embarrassing part. It was what they did next. Gents, I have to tell you, this story stuck with me for years. And when I happened to be in Asia, I stopped into one of their flagship stores and picked up what I think to be one of the most amazing watches in my personal collection. So what's the brand I'm talking about? What's the story? Gentlemen, that's the subject of today's video. Now, this new watch brand was being manufactured in the SUA subsidiary of a larger watch brand that was well known for lower end wrist watches. But the goal of this new brand was to break out of the mold and they felt they could do that by focusing in on technical efficiency. The first model was powered by a caliber 3180, which was a simple mechanical winding movement. Now, this caliber was decent. It had a chronometer grade precision of plus 12 to minus three seconds a day, but it wasn't great. In fact, what happened next would change the landscaping of watchmaking forever. But before I get into that, I need to give you an idea of what's going on with these observatory competitions. You see, for most of recorded history, timekeeping was not very accurate, which may not seem like that big of a deal. But if you're traveling, especially by sea, being off by a couple seconds per day over time can throw you off dozens, if not over a hundred miles, which when you're trying to hit an island in the middle of the ocean can make for a very dangerous journey. So there was this contest, the longitude prize, 20,000 pounds to the person that could develop a timekeeping device that on a boat could maintain accuracy of time. Now the device that won was John Harrison's H4 Marine Chronometer. Aboard the HMS Deptford in a period of 81 days from Portsmouth to Jamaica, this timekeeping device had just deviated 5.1 seconds. And this first competition was just the beginning. As watchmaking, as timekeeping came into its own, all of a sudden you had all of these different trials setting up. One of the most popular was the Q trials. Now, King George III's observatory at Q became very popular in part because they were very transparent. Now, as more and more precision watchmaking moved to Switzerland, so did the observatory trials. In fact, you could argue that by the 1960s, the most prestigious observatory trials were at Neuchâtel. And that's where, gentlemen, our Asian upstart decided to go and make a name for themselves. So the year is 1964 and our upstart decides to travel to Europe and they're going to enter the Neuchâtel observatory trials. On a side note, yes, I know that there were two subsidiaries of Sukosha that actually entered the trials. Uh, for today's video, I'm going to just combine them into one to make it simple. So their first year entering the contest, the Asian upstart, yeah, ended up in 144th place. It was a miserable finish. In fact, they didn't get a single watch certified as a chronometer. So in 1965, they re-entered the contest and this time they placed 114th and they had three movements actually certified as chronometers. In 1966, they returned and they had one of their watches place ninth. In addition, they had 33 of their movements certified as chronometers. In 1967, it was even better. They had 62 movements certified as chronometers and one of their movements took fourth overall. And then in 1968, the trials were abruptly canceled. You see, what I didn't mention is not only was this upstart moving up in the rankings, but they were dominating all the places after their place. So although the Neuchâtel competitions had been canceled, there were still the Geneva competitions. And you know, the Japanese are like, hey, we're here. We might as well enter this other competition. They went on to sweep the top 10. Well, they got places four through 10. Guess what? Places one through three. Yes, the Swiss did get those, but they were using quartz movements. Basically, they were cheating. And the Neuchâtel Observatory eventually did release how the watches performed. They didn't have the competition, but everyone could rank things. And it turned out that two of the entries from that upstart placed second and third in terms of all time high scores. So basically, it's safe to say they would have easily gotten second and third in that 1968 competition. I almost forgot. So the Swiss did in 2009 bring back the observatory trials and they laid out like the whole reasoning for it. But if you go and read the details, one of the more interesting things about this contest is that the parts and the watches entered must all be manufactured in Europe. 
So much for a uh, fair world contest, right? So gents, in case you haven't figured it out, the brand I'm talking about in today's video is Grand Seiko. And gents, don't confuse Seiko with Grand Seiko. They are very different companies. They're manufactured in different factories. Yes, Grand Seiko did offshoot, but you know, Seiko was founded in 1881 and is a brand in of itself. Grand Seiko is the lesser known brand that has really gone towards the luxury market. And when you look at their watches, you look at the build, you look at the quality, you look at those dials. There is a huge difference between the two. Now, years ago, I learned about the Grand Seiko brand and I knew that if I ever got the chance to go to Japan, I would grab one of these watches. Yeah, I was in Tokyo just this summer, took my son, it was, he graduated high school. This was the gift he wanted to take a trip with me and we had a few family members with us. And we're like, hey, let's go. And I made it a point to stop in at the Waco store right there in Ginza and talk about an amazing store, an amazing experience. And I do want to thank my friend Naomi over at Watch Spirits. She's got an amazing channel. I'll link to her down in the description of today's video, but she got me a VIP tour and I went through and I looked at all their watches. I went upstairs, went into their museum. It was an amazing experience being able to see all the different watches in their glory presented by, I think people that, th these weren't salesmen. These were people that loved the watches. In fact, the gentleman I worked with to pick out my watch, I noticed he was wearing a Grand Seiko and I complimented on it. He then told me the story about how this was his father's Grand Seiko. I and mean, the thing looked beautiful, it looked brand new. Turned out that watch was over 30 years old. Now I get it. I'm making a pretty bold claim in today's video that Rolex can't compete with Grand Seiko. But I do think in many ways, Rolex really could learn a lot from this upstart Japanese company that hasn't been around nearly as long and is just in the last decade started making a footprint outside of Japan. Just seeing these watches in person and let's start with the customer service. That is the first thing I have to say. So I went and I explored Tokyo and I popped into a couple Grand Seiko boutiques. Actually, they weren't even all Grand Seiko boutiques. One was just a regular high-end watch store, but every single watch person recognized I was wearing a Grand Seiko and they thanked me for supporting their flagship business. Now, that may not sound like a big deal, but I can't tell you how many times I've been in other watch stores and no one has ever thanked me for wearing one of their watches. Walking into, it doesn't matter what brand it is, I could be wearing their watch in there and I've done this multiple times and no one seemed to even pick up. Yeah, maybe they pick up, oh, it's a Rolex or something like that because I have to take it off, but I didn't take the watch off. And every single time, these people were just so proud of their homegrown brand. And if you know anything about Seiko, anything about Grand Seiko, there's so much handwork that goes into this. In particular, when it comes to craftsmanship, let's talk about the Zeratsu polishing. If you're not familiar with this, this is a unique method that only Grand Seiko uses that results in an exceptional distortion-free mirror finish that allows the wearer to see the meticulous attention to detail. Seriously, gents, it's absolutely beautiful. When you see it in person, you'll see the difference between this and a regular finished watch. And let's talk about innovation. Now, I didn't actually opt for a watch with a spring drive. But if you haven't heard of this, basically, you know, everyone's like, you got to choose between quartz, you got to choose between mechanical. Grand Seiko was like, you know, why don't we combine the two and take the best of both worlds? And that's exactly what they did with their spring drive watches. The result was a watch that is incredibly accurate, yet has the soul of a mechanical watch still intact. And if that's not enough, let's talk about their high beat movements. Now, the average watch is going to beat at 28,800, which basically means every second you're going to have eight beats. Beats. This allows the watch basically when the second hand is moving to move smoothly and it ensures it keeps accurate time. Now, an interesting thing is to go higher beat, a higher frequency. So basically, if you go up to 36,000, which is where we're going to see a lot of Grand Seikos operate, you actually get, in a sense, better balance. You get actually more accurate timekeeping, but there is a downside. You're going to get, you're going to draw more power. So usually the power reserve is going to be lower. Grand Seiko has actually been able to come in and and hey, you want 3,600 uh, and you want an 80 hour power reserve, guess what? We are going to defy the law of physics. We're going to give it to you. 
I think what most watch guys really appreciate about Grand Seiko is that they never stop innovating. They get back to that mantra at the very beginning. They want to create a watch which is not only beautiful, but one that's going to be functional. Talk about in-house manufacturing. I mentioned it earlier. These guys grow their own crystals. Every single part of the watch, every single detail, even the boxes, everything is made in-house because they want to control every single aspect from the alloys, the materials that they are making. They actually, yes, they make the metals. And let's talk about accuracy. So this watch right here, I know is going to be plus five or minus three per day. That exceeds Swiss chronometer uh, standards. Like I talked about their uh, quartz drives, their spring drives. These can be within like five to six seconds in an entire year that these things are going to be accurate. In a nutshell, gents, you can pay twice, you can pay 10 times, you can pay a hundred times more for a watch, but you're not going to get a more accurate timekeeper when it comes to mechanical watches than you will with Grand Seiko. So now let's talk about the dials. If you've ever seen a beautiful watch, it's something that, yeah, you look at that dial and you immediately love the color, you fall in love with the shape, the design, but there's something special about Grand Seiko and the detail they go into with the texture of the dials. It's pretty rare that a watch manufacturer does this on one or two watches. It seems like though Grand Seiko did this on a number of watches. Now the most famous one out there is going to be the Snowflake. The snowflake made to represent winter and just freshly laid snow. Whenever you see this in person, I mean, from a picture, it doesn't look like much, but you see this in person and there is just something magical about it. Now, this was the watch that I thought I would pick up when I was in Japan. They had it in stock. They pulled it out. I got to touch it. I got to hold it. I seriously considered grabbing this watch, but I decided not to because the sizing was a little bit off. It was just a little bit too large for me. And I have to admit, I do not like that power reserve, that little complication right there just really isn't, I, I don't know, I feel it throws the watch off, not to my liking. So I kept looking around and was looking at all these different beautiful watches. And then I saw this one right here. I didn't even, yes, I knew about the birch, uh, the white birch, I skipped that one. I immediately went to what is known as the show show. Now, if you're familiar with Japanese culture, you probably know they don't have four seasons. They actually have 72 seasons. And one of the seasons is show show. And this is high summer. Now, when I saw this dial, I immediately thought of being back home here in Wisconsin and being out on the lake. And when I found out that's exactly, well, it was made for Japanese lakes, not Wisconsin lakes, but it was made to represent the wind blowing across the thousands of lakes and ponds throughout Japan, creating this delicate ripples along the top of the water that shimmer under the early summer sun. I also happened to be in Japan at about the time of that season. It wasn't exactly lined up with Shosho, but it was close and it was hot and muggy outside. And we were about to get on a bullet train and go over to Kyoto and uh, to be able to see the water. I just like, we saw like, you know what? This watch is absolutely beautiful. Let me learn a little bit more about it. Now, the caliber is a 9S86, which again is going to be at their high beat at 36,000. So that's 10 beats per second. And as far as I could see, the only drawback was that there was only a 55 hour power reserve. But for me, as long as it's got a 24 hour power reserve, because there are some days, you know, I won't wear the watch, but hey, if I get at least one day, so I was fine with that. I was like, hey, okay, you know, I would like to have seen 80, but uh, 55 is fine. And again, looking at that dial, this time under a different light, what I loved is how it played it. One time it would look silver, and then I'd see a light blue. Depending on the light and the way that it hit the dial and the way that I was looking at it, I would see slightly different things. It was absolutely beautiful. In fact, of all the watches I have in my collection, this one by far is the most beautiful watch. And in fact, since coming back from Japan a couple weeks ago, I have not taken this off of my wrist. Another thing I loved about this watch, and I think that makes Grand Seiko in many ways better than Rolex, is the transparent case backs. So not going to find it on every Grand Seiko, but a lot of them, you're going to be able to see the inside of the watch, the inner workings, the mechanics. It's absolutely beautiful to be able to take the watch and look at the inside to be able to see, you know, the winder, all the details that go into it. Yeah, you don't always get the best view, but you get a much better view than you do on a Rolex that rarely ever has a transparent back. And I get it why, you know, if you want something that's going to be able to go down to 200, you know, meters or beyond, you probably don't want to have a transparent 
case back. But I think for the vast majority of us that just want something that, hey, is going to be beautiful, that we can admire, and it's pretty cool to be able to see the inside of your watch. So I really appreciate this part of Grand Seiko. And let's talk about availability. So now Rolex is becoming a little bit more available. I know a lot of you guys that were on wait lists are now getting phone calls from the authorized dealers because, hey, they got, they got to move those things. They're dropping in price. But with Grand Seiko, you could always, if you knew where to go, you could get pretty much any watch you want. And they're not going to be marked up to exorbitant prices. Yes, they're occasionally ones you're going to pay a little bit above retail. Any place I looked around, you know, that it was something that you can find and you can get your hands on pretty much any model of Grand Seiko that you want. You can't say the same thing for Rolex. Another thing I loved, and this was in particular with the Waco store, they actually had a Grand Seiko you could only buy in that store, which I thought was pretty darn cool. I looked at it. It uh, was attractive. At the time, I was wearing my Rolex Explorer. It reminded me too much of that. It also was a little bit too small and it just really didn't drive me. It was a beautiful watch, but I decided, yeah, I'm very happy with the show show. Now let's talk about price. So Grand Seiko is not going to be cheap. That being said, if you look around, you can find some used Grand Seikos, I think, at a really reasonable price. You can get a quartz Grand Seiko at an entry-level price. And if you look around, there are tons of options. And I think, though, what you're getting um, with Rolex, let's face it, you're getting a bunch of marketing. I love Rolex. I've got a number of Rolexes, but I know I'm buying into hype. I'm buying into marketing. You can flip them. That, that is the nice thing about Rolex. Uh, they have over time increased in value if you take good care of them. And they're good functional watches. But man, when it comes to functionality, when it comes to value, when it comes to getting a watch that uh, is just absolutely beautiful, I have to say it's really hard to beat what Grand Seiko offers. On top of that, let's talk about warranty. Let's talk about service. Uh, you know, if you buy from an authorized dealer, Rolex does come with a warranty, but Grand Seiko comes with a, not just a warranty, but when you send it in to get service done by an authorized dealer, it's going to be more affordable than getting work done on a Rolex. Now, there is, I think, a drawback, especially if you get a high beat watch. Uh, this is going to require service probably sooner than a lower beat watch. But uh, again, you know, just everything I read about Grand Seiko and I haven't had to service this thing yet, but when I do, um, you know, I'm pretty much, I, I know that I won't get ripped off. All right, gentlemen. So what video to watch next? Well, if you want a functional watch that's cheaper than Rolex, but still has all the same quality details, check out this brand or this video right here. And I reveal the brand in this video. I think it's a good one. Check it out right here. Boom. I think you'll enjoy it. If you enjoyed this video, you'll like this one right there.